Good evening. Thank you for joining Metropolitan Community College's virtual Juneteenth celebration. Juneteenth, short for June 19th, marks the day when federal troops arrived in Galveston, Texas in 1865 to take control of the state and ensure that all enslaved people be freed. The troops arrival came a full two and a half years after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. Juneteenth honors the end of slavery in the United States and is considered the longest running African-American holiday. On June 17, 2021, it officially became a federal holiday. Your microphones are silenced. Please use the chat function to send communications to myself, the moderator, James Hawthorne. I will present your questions to our speaker after his presentation. And also watch the chat for a link to an online evaluation. The NAACP or National Association for the Advancement of Colored People was established in 1909 and is America's oldest and largest civil rights organization. It was formed in New York City by white and black activists partially in response to the ongoing violence against African Americans around the country. In the NAACP's early decades, its anti-lynching campaign was central to its agenda. During the civil rights era in the 1950s and 1960s, the group won major legal victories, and today the NAACP has more than 2,200 branches and some half a million members worldwide. The NAACP's founding members include white progressivist Mary White Ovington, Henry Moskowitz, William English Walling, and Oswald Garrison Villard, along with such African Americans as Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, Ida Wells Barnett, Archibald Grimke, and Mary Church Terrell. Tonight, we have the honor of hearing from the president of the Omaha chapter of the NAACP, Pastor T. Michael Williams, senior pastor of Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church in Omaha, Nebraska, who hails from Albuquerque, New Mexico. He moved to Omaha, Nebraska in 1986 to attend Grace College of the Bible, earning dual degrees in pastoral ministries and Bible. He also completed a Master of Arts degree in Biblical Studies from Grace University in 2002. He is currently in his 31st year of pastoring, having served Risen Sun Baptist Church for 30 years before merging with Mount Moriah in 2019. Pastor Williams has served in various community roles, including the Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance and the Omaha Public Schools Bond Committee. In 2021, Reverend Williams was also elected as the new NAACP president of the Omaha chapter. He is married to the former Cheryl Jones, a QA analyst engineer at Werner Enterprises. Please welcome Reverend T. Michael Williams, who will present Juneteenth celebrating emancipation. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Reverend Hawthorne. I just uh, want to say uh, it's a blessing to be with you all tonight. And uh, this is kind of the presentation order that we'll have. I'll do an introduction of myself. I'll talk about Juneteenth a little, very little bit from a national perspective, and then Juneteenth from an Omaha perspective, talk a little bit about this year's Juneteenth celebration here in Omaha. And then I'll talk about the NAACP, uh, national, Omaha, and then uh, we'll have some discussion. Um, so I uh, was born, as you've heard, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, I was uh, born to a family uh, whose dad was in the army, and so we moved around some. Uh, I uh, was raised uh, mostly in Albuquerque, uh, but lived on uh, Army bases. I have the distinction of going to the same, same high school that Shaquille O'Neal attended in uh, San Antonio, Texas uh, at Fort Sam Houston, uh, Robert G. Cole High School. Uh, and uh, also, uh, as you've heard, was elected to serve as president of the NAACP here in Omaha in uh, sept uh, no November of 2021. So um, I like to begin talking about 
Juneteenth from a national perspective by talking about uh, the, the issue of slavery uh, as uh, we, the in, initial um, preliminary document of the Emancipation Proclamation was issued uh, September 22nd in 1862. And President Lincoln gave 100 days uh, till January 1st, 1863, for all enslaved people in the states then in, engaged in rebellion against the Union to be set free. It is interesting that the Emancipation Proclamation didn't instantly free any of the enslaved people. The, uh, the proclamation only applied to places under Confederate control and not to slaveholding border states or rebel areas already under Union control. So as Northern troops advanced into Confederate South, many enslaved people fled behind Union lines. It is interesting that Frederick Douglass had a major role in helping President Lincoln come to the place of think of pursuing emancipation because uh, he uh, lobbied him consistently, very much uh, like President Kennedy uh, lobbied, uh, was lobbied by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on civil rights. Uh, it is interesting to me that uh, one of the quotes from uh, President Lincoln is, my paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. He wrote in an editorial uh, of the Daily National Intelligence in uh, August 1862. He says, if I could save the Union without freeing only a few slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all of the slaves, I would do it. I we're glad that he freed all the slaves, amen? <laughs> um, as you've heard, slavery in Texas continued past the Emancipation Proclamation. It's very interesting that even after General Granger and the soldiers came into Texas, even after the announcement in Galveston that the National Archives record that many of the enslavers in Texas did not announce the Emancipation Proclamation, the fact that slaves were free until after the harvest had been taken in. So it didn't, emancipation didn't happen for everyone overnight and it didn't happen, it wasn't effective actually uh, across the nation until the 13th amendment passed in December of 1865. This is a picture of the document uh, that actually uh, was written by General Granger that was presented in uh, Galveston and it is uh, in uh, war records um, today. So regardless of the timing, celebrations broke out all over Texas and specifically uh, in the Galveston area. And regardless of the interest of some, uh, newly freed Black people uh, celebrated and Juneteenth was born. The thing that's interesting about this is that it was called Emancipation Day for a lot of places early on. This building is the place where the very first Emancipation Day celebration happened in Omaha, Nebraska. 
Uh, this building, the Grand Opera House, uh, was a uh, great place for uh, gatherings at that time. And uh, it was called Exposition Hall. It was located on North 15th and Capitol Avenue downtown. And at that time, the celebration was uh, sponsored by a group called the Sicilian Club. One of the things that's interesting is that um, this celebration in 1891 is the first one that is on record. A lot of the things that I'm going to share with you uh, come from uh, records from newspapers in the in the area uh, and in in that era. Excuse me. But one of the things that's that's interesting about this is that it was it was an Omaha celebration in 1891 but it was a, a, a kind of a regional celebration. People came up from Kansas. Uh, there were certainly people from Iowa uh, that, that joined in the celebration. And uh, that first celebration uh, had a um, great time of music. There was a pianist called Professor McPherson who performed on a grand piano there were operas, there were comedies and other songs played. A uh, Miss Lenora Smith recited uh, the Emancipation Proclamation and was followed by uh, Dr. Matthew Ricketts who spoke about the accomplishments of African-Americans uh, since emancipation and explored the history of slavery in the United States. A uh, Miss uh, Maddie Walker sang Far From Me and Omaha's first African-American lawyer, Silas Robbins, spoke about the general theme of the possibilities of the Negro race. Unfortunately, less than a month after uh, this celebration of emancipation here in Omaha, a man named George Smith was lynched, having been accused of sexually assaulting a 12-year-old girl. Uh, and he was lynched in downtown Omaha. And uh, on, uh, so the next year in 1892, there was not a celebration of emancipation. And uh, there was a celebration then in 1893. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it was proven shortly after Smith's death, death that not only was the girl not assaulted, uh, was, excuse me, by him, but she hadn't been assaulted at all. So it was a very unfortunate uh, situation. Um, the 1890s and early 1900s after uh, 1893 saw consistent celebration in Omaha of Emancipation Day, and it was a big deal. There were choirs, bands, picnics, there were sporting events with baseball games, foot races, horses races, there were hot air balloons. They were fairly new, but there were hot air balloons. Uh, Early on, a club called the Triumvirate Club uh, sponsored Juneteenth. Uh, the Masons at, at one point sponsored Juneteenth celebrations, the Knights and Daughters of Tabor, and even a church called Mount Pisgah Baptist Church, which is the forerunner of Mount Moriah here, uh, sponsored um, Juneteenth celebrations in the early uh, uh, 1900s. This is uh, Exposition Hall. Uh, it was again located uh, at uh, 15th and uh, Capitol, downtown Omaha. And it burned down the next year. And that's why they didn't have another celebration there. Um, and this is the document that uh, is in the archives uh, now in uh, uh, Galveston, I believe, uh, that General uh, Granger uh, signed uh, and wrote to the folks in Texas to uh, inform them of the, uh, that was the official document that informed them of the, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. And then this is the flyer that uh, was used uh, for the fifth emancipation celebration. 
And uh, I just wonder, it says there at the beautiful Krug Park. Anybody have any idea? It's interesting as we go through, there are a couple of different uh, locations that they mentioned that all the names have changed, but they're names that we are familiar with. This is Gallagher Park. Uh, right across from Benson High School. And so that space uh, facilitated and held a Juneteenth celebration uh, back in the uh, 18, probably 98, 1899, somewhere in that, that time frame, 1900. Some of the organizations, again, that sponsored, uh, I, I mentioned uh, the Knights and Daughters of Tabor, Mount Pisgah Baptist, uh, church that became Mount Moriah. Uh, the Omaha Star uh, sponsored a number of Juneteenth in the late 30s and, and early 40s. And uh, uh, they were also held at a place called Syndicate Park. Anybody familiar with what that name is? Syndicate Park is Spring Lake Park today. And so they celebrated in, in, in the southern part of the south part of the city and also uh, at a place called Hibbler Park, uh, which was a private facility at 44th and Leavenworth. And uh, they, they had mayors and uh, preachers and governors, you know, politicians all making uh, speeches at, at those celebrations. And I want to also uh, share this slide. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Matthew Ricketts. He was an MD here in Omaha, uh, came here uh, and, and was educated and then uh, left in 1901 and went uh, to Missouri. Uh, but he came back. He was a featured speaker at the uh, Juneteenth celebrations from the first one that we have recorded in these newspapers from 1891 all the way to 1909. And uh, he was uh, the first black legislature, legislator in the Nebraska legislature as well. A very prominent individual in the community. Um, one of the other things that's interesting about Emancipation Day in Omaha is that uh, from 1914 to 1922, there was not celebration of Emancipation Day. It's hard to fully document exactly why, but uh, that was kind of the heyday of a uh, notorious figure in Omaha named Tom Dennison. I don't know if you all are familiar with him. Uh, he was a boss, a political boss, and uh, he uh, wasn't, I guess, in favor of it. Uh, also, World War I happened during those years, and also the lynching of Will Brown and uh, Mayor Edward Smith, who was uh, an opponent of Tom Dennison. And uh, uh, soon after the next election, um, Tom Dennison's guy got elected again. So um, there weren't um, Juneteenth celebrations, em Emancipation Day celebrations during that time. Uh, throughout the 1930s, the Omaha Guide, a black owned newspaper sponsored Emancipation Day. Uh, the celebrations were held at the Elks Hall uh, located on Lake Street be, uh, between 24th and 25th Street. That Elks Hall is still there. Uh, and the celebration featured music, again, speeches, readings, vocal performances, and prayers, again, celebrating uh, emancipation of African Americans. At some point, the celebration stopped again. Uh, on September 23, 1943, there was a letter to the editor of the Omaha World Herald. And in that letter, it said, Wednesday was Emancipation Day and 99 out of 100 never knew it. Or that we used to have big parades and meetings with speeches on that day. Again, most of these uh, items are coming from uh, the Omaha Bee, 
that was a newspaper back in the day. Uh, the Omaha World Herald was around and also the Omaha Star. Uh, there was also uh, the Omaha Monitor. Um, Emancipation Day uh, evolved into Juneteenth here in Omaha and the first celebration of Juneteenth happened in 1977. The Woodson Center over in South Omaha, originally established as the Omaha Negro Cultural Center, uh, celebrated uh, the annual Juneteenth Emancipation Day picnic. Uh, and then June 17th, 1984, Woodson Park at 3014 Jefferson Street was the site of the celebration. The Omaha chapter of the NAACP has sponsored the city's uh, Juneteenth celebrations uh, since 1989. And through 2010, we kind of, the NAACP was kind of uh, responsible for uh, putting together what went on. And um, uh, back in 1989, it was held at Corinth Memorial Baptist Church on January 12th. And the goal was focusing the attention on the NAACP. Um, today, uh, the NAACP specifically sponsors the Juneteenth Parade. Uh, you see our flyer here for this year's parade, which will happen uh, this coming Saturday, uh, beginning at 10 p.m. down on 24th Street. Um, and it is uh, an exciting time. This picture of the uh, uh, one of the drill teams performing uh, is on uh, North 30th Street. Uh, one of the things that has also bec become a, a great part of the celebration today in Omaha is the uh, Freedom Fest that takes place beginning at noon after the parade uh, at the Malcolm X Center uh, here in, in, in North Omaha. And as I said, the parade this year will be uh, on 24th Street. Uh, it was moved off of 24th Street um, uh, back in uh, 2000. And uh, we are really excited to be back uh, on North 24th Street. And for those folks who are um, residents and, and uh, longtime native Omahans, it means a lot to them to have of the parade here on uh, North 24th Street. Again, it'll start at 10 o'clock. It'll uh, start at Lake Street and go all the way to Sprague. So let me uh, ask any thoughts, comments, questions regarding what I've shared just about the Emancipation Day Juneteenth uh, celebration itself here in, in Omaha. Okay, next, let me just share you, share with you. Uh, this, this is a picture of the individuals that uh, Reverend Hawthorne uh, shared with us. They founded uh, the NAACP nationally in 1909. Uh, and we here in Omaha uh, were founded in, we began work in 1914. So we are a very old uh, branch as far as NAACP branches are, are concerned. Uh, uh, this woman, um, hope you can see my uh, pointer here, but uh, Ida Wells uh, actually came to Omaha. Uh, Mary uh, Ovington, uh, Mary White Ovington came to Omaha in the early days, uh, forming of the of the NAACP here in Omaha, and and organized and and helped to set up uh, our branch here. Our branch um, began in 1914, as I said, in terms of them uh, working, but they were actually uh, chartered in 1919 here in Omaha. And it's been an active branch, to be honest. Uh, it's had its ebbs and flows. We currently are kind of coming out of uh, a, a tough time uh, because of COVID as far as uh, the work of the NAACP and, and actively uh, being involved in uh, what we normally do. 
Uh, we haven't had a parade in uh, this uh, two years. Uh, so this will be our first parade in a few in a while. We're excited about that. And uh, we are doing some other things that I'll tell you about. But I wanted to just share uh, Derek Johnson is the current president of the national uh, NAACP. Um, and uh, we just went through, uh, you can imagine we, we uh, hadn't uh, had a lot of work going on for a while. So when I was elected, one of the things we decided to do was just kind of reacclimate and to uh, do a, a mission and vision. And we, we were thinking about uh, 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 changing uh, our mission and vision statement from the nationals, but the national actually beat us to the change. These are new mission and vision statements that uh, are our national and we adopted them. Uh, and just so you understand the way the NAACP works, we are a branch here in Omaha and cities all over the country as uh, Reverend Hawthorne said, have branches. And then there, there are state organizations that comprised of a number of branches, depending on the number of branches in an area. You might have uh, a, a state organization, like for instance, Mississippi, Alabama down South, they'll have two or three state organizations in one area. But uh, our uh, branch here is a member of the Iowa, Nebraska uh, state uh, organization. We had actually a quarterly meeting this past Saturday and um, our, uh, the headquarters for that, the president is a Miss Betty Andrews and she's located there in, uh, in, in, in uh, Des Moines, Iowa. Let me just uh, share with you uh, this picture right here. Uh, this man, Reverend John A. Williams founded, uh, was the leader that founded Omaha chapter of the NAACP, they really worked around lynching and uh, jobs. Uh, you remember you, in your history, the red summer of 1919, the uh, number of lynchings that happened across the country. And it wasn't just 1919, really from 1917 uh, to the end of 1919, early 1920 was really a tough time. Uh, African-Americans who had been uh, in World War I, who understood what it was to be free, who had fought for the country, uh, came back and, and uh, didn't want to take what, you know, the kind of the, the Jim Crow and some of the discrimination that they had experienced prior to. And uh, uh, there were other, uh, many, many whites were having hard times with jobs and, and so forth. And it just was a, a not a good, a climate for uh, race relations. And a number of people across the country were lynched during those days. If you're familiar with uh, Black Wall Street in Tulsa, that happened in 1921, part of that same, you know, kind of time frame. Also, uh, Colfax massacre in Florida happened uh, around that time. Uh, and and that, that's just a, a few of them. Um, so, uh, the branch was was founded. It it, uh, it 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 flourished. There was a time our branch had uh, over 800 members. It was actually a multiracial, uh, and really that's the best uh, condition for the NAACP to work in. Actually, uh, it's not just African Americans uh, doing the work, um, and so. Uh, I want to talk now just a little bit about our local uh, branch and, and what we're doing uh, now. Uh, any questions before I go to that? Any questions or comments? Reverend Williams, there are two questions that have come in. Um, the first question is, what can a visitor to the Juneteenth celebration expect to see at Omaha's Juneteenth celebration? <laughs> um, I tell you, we have, we're having organizational meetings today. One's going on right now at Zion Baptist Church. We had one at noon. There were probably 65 organizations uh, here at noon today. You will see drill teams, you will see bands, you will see dance 
organizations, you will see um, individuals that represent North Omaha history. We will have uh, legacy, our theme is, is legends and legacy for this year's uh, Juneteenth celebration. We have that theme because we want to tie, you know, sort of old North Omaha to new young North Omaha and try to in, uh, engage our youth and instill in our youth uh, pride for the community and the idea that uh, their community is just as vibrant as any other community. Uh, uh, we will have, uh, so we will have uh, uh, legends in terms of uh, retired principals from uh, OPS and uh, district will be in the parade. Uh, I can't tell you about our grand marshal because that's a surprise secret. Okay. okay. Uh, but um, uh, you will see organizations that support the community. Uh, uh, Lincoln Financial Group, for instance, uh, Children's Hospital, for instance, will have uh, entries in, in, in the parade. Uh, youth sports leagues will have entries. As a matter of fact, uh, we were concerned because we hadn't had the parade in a uh, few years. We were concerned about what the interest would be. And uh, we were thinking if we had 65 entrants, that would be uh, really wonderful. Well, we have a hundred, and that is the the limit that the police department has has given us. So uh, we reached the limit. We have a hundred entrants, and uh, it'll be it'll be a fun time. Awesome, awesome. And I know uh, Reverend Williams, you did mention that the uh, parade route uh, is being moved back to 24th Street. So that being said, can you tell us uh, what the starting and the end point is for the parade? Yes, the parade will start at 24th and Lake. Uh, staging will happen further south uh, around uh, Parker and uh, uh, around Grant Street, around Zion. There will be staging, but the parade will actually start at 24th and Lake awesome. and will go uh, north uh, down 24th Street to Spray. Awesome. Uh, the uh, individuals in the parade will go past Sprague and they will be then put on, uh, get on buses to go back to their cars. We're, the way we're doing it this year, a number of the individuals that aren't in a vehicle that's actually in the parade or a float that's actually in the parade, they're parking at Salem Baptist Church and being bused down to the parade site and then bused back. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question, uh, there is a human services ethics class attending tonight. In what ways does the NAACP address ethics in its work? What kind of ethical issues do NAACP leaders face? Well, I'll tell you, um, in my thinking, voting rights has ethical aspects to it. Uh, quality education and what we learn in the classroom, what our children learn, have ethical uh, aspects to it. Uh, and that helps me transition that question into some of the things we're doing now. Um, so for the folks in the ethics class uh, in uh, April, what we're trying to do is engage people, what we're calling it in East-West conversations. And we're doing them both virtuous, excuse me, both virtually and uh, in person at uh, the UNO um, White's Conference Center. Um, we've done two of them. The first one was on voting rights. Um, and when you think about the efforts in Nebraska with the voter ID law, uh, we feel like uh, it is both unfair and unethical to try to say that we can really, uh, that our, there are, our elections need to be made safer through voter ID. Um, ethically, <laughs> I think it's, it's unfortunate that 
there was there there's a, a group called uh, Citizens for Voter ID, uh, chaired by Senator Salama in our state legislature. What I was saying is, um, and this is documented, uh, that organization's uh, raised $351,000 to pursue voter ID uh, in Nebraska to pursue that law. And $350,000 of that money was given by Governor uh, Ricketts' mother. Uh, and and $1,000 was given by uh, Hal Dodd. Um, and and I, I just don't, you know, I mean, everybody has a right to participate in the process, but in my thinking, uh, that uh, is, is, is out of order. That's, that's just out of order. Uh, so um, in, in, in terms of ethics, I think what we're dealing with in our society today racially uh, is, is, is a matter of ethics. Uh, uh, in our, uh, that was our, our, our voter ID, uh, conversation in our uh, education conversation we had an education uh, excuse me we had a conversation uh, in in uh, May called uh, East West conversation race and education the real talk and basically it was CRT in education the idea that we ought not to allow uh, race uh, and people's position on that to interfere with what we teach our kids. And so uh, one of the things that I said in introducing and opening that conversation was, was this, um, our founding fathers understood, even though not all of them you know, agreed on, on it, but the, the majority of our founding fathers understood that slavery was wrong. Yet, for the sake of, you know, a union, as far as the 13 states, but beyond that, for really profit, they went ahead and agreed to slavery. That's an ethical issue. And the way I think about it, that's America's original sin just as the folks in the, in the garden taking a bite of the fruit, <laughs> you know, is original sin. And so America hasn't come to grips with that. And so the civil rights, the, excuse me, the, the NAACP is a civil rights organization that's helping to, or, or working to come to grips with that in our, in our country. And, and uh, locally, um, we're organized like the national to address issues in a number of areas, civil rights issues in a number of areas. I'll stop there. I don't know uh, if that was uh, helpful, but from my perspective. Thank you for that, Reverend Williams. I think that did address uh, the question. So uh, with that being said, I know you uh, mentioned that there's some things going on here locally. Um, and I also know and looking at the website um, that the NAACP um, is accepting uh, new members. So with that being said, how can persons who are interested in, in, in helping in, in these efforts uh, become a member of the NAACP? I have a slide here that has kind of contact information. Uh, I can certainly uh, thin that, but uh, uh, and and either calling the number, going on Facebook, uh, our email. We're actually uh, remodeling our website right now, so uh, these are the best ways at this point. Um, and uh, I uh, <laughs> uh, could also, if the individuals want to put their address in the, the addresses in the chat, we can send them an application over uh, email be, and be happy to do that. Awesome, awesome, thank you. And I know that uh, one of the professors, uh, Professor Cusick had her hand up, so we will allow her to ask her question. Well, um, I didn't really have the question, but Carrie had the question. 
which is the other side that gets sick. I am so sorry. Many of my students came in under my invitation. They were having trouble getting on. So it would be the person in the Be Kind t-shirt. Otherwise, Carrie, put it in the chat for Barbara. But while I'm on, I want to say thank you. It's wonderful. Thank you, Cynthia, for bringing your students. And Carrie, if you could put that in the chat, we'll speak it out for you. If that's not possible, um, let me know somehow. OK, I have a question here. Are there local student chapters of the NAACP? How can I best get my ESL students involved and aware of the organization? Um, our we have a, a a chapter that is um, chartered at UNO, and uh, honestly, over the time of COVID, they need to be rechartered. But actually, uh, Dr. Gooch Grayson uh, will be not isn't yet, but will be uh, the uh, contact for for that group. So uh, the goal is to restart that organization. And there's also uh, room to have a uh, youth uh, organization as well, youth uh, chapter, I should say it that way. Uh, and, and the other thing is for our youth, uh, you are probably uh, familiar, Reverend Hawthorne, that uh, NAACP uh, sponsors uh, what they call AXO, competitions that are local, state, and national, and just allows youth to uh, display their talent. And uh, that we will be uh, starting that again in, in 2023. So I just stay, stay uh, keep, keep up with our website if you would. Okay, here's another. You mentioned that the Emancipation Proclamation only freed slaves from Confederate states, but not border states under the control of the union. How did this practice play out for border states? Was there any level of freedom for slaves in those states? Well, to be honest, uh, I didn't talk about that, but Nebraska itself was a slave state. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, 1820, with the Missouri Compromise, it became a, a free slave but state. But in 1854, with the Kansas-Nebraska Act, uh, Nebraska itself was a slave state until uh, late 1862. And so uh, it practiced slavery and actually it was uh, denied entrance into the union until 1867 because of some of the language in its uh, state, state documents, uh, racial language. Uh, and so it, it uh, you know, how did it play out? Uh, it, it, you know, honestly, you know, ended in the Civil War, you know, I mean, you know, had 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 those those states um, uh, were impacted in that way. And um, I think uh, I'm trying to think what the time frame was, but if I'm not mistaken, the redlining and some of that that happened in Omaha kind of comes out of that, that thinking, if I can say it that way. All right, thank you so much for that information. Uh, so Barbara Velasquez has just put in the chat, those who are interested in a student chapter of the NAACP, uh, you may email Barb um, and her email is there in the chat and she will also make sure that Dr. Gooch Grayson receives your contact information as well. Uh, perfect. And so with that being said, uh, Reverend Williams, I know you did mention um, that there were going to be uh, some opportunities coming forth for youth to demonstrate their uh, talents and whatnot um, starting back in 2023. Um, I also wanted to find out, are there any scholarship opportunities or anything like that for college students who are active in the NAACP? Uh, yes, there are. Um... And that would be um, handled through the chapter. Okay. So the chapter is affiliated with the branch. It's not actually uh, a part of the branch. So it's kind of interesting how they do that. The youth 
are actually under the branch, but the chapter is separate. It's kind of an, its own entity. Okay, awesome, awesome. Uh, we do have another question too. Uh, if you would, could you please speak to the transition of slavery into the imprisonment of former slaves and how that has transitioned into today? Well, in, in, in my thinking, the issue has to do with just laws. When you think about imprisonment, uh, unfortunately, laws uh, impact uh, people of color more than they do individuals uh, that are Caucasian. Uh, that's, you know, one of the uh, obvious examples of that is the difference in a sentence uh, from a person that is arrested with crack cocaine and, and powder cocaine. I mean, that's one of the clear instances of, of that difference. And so, um, you know, I think the issue simply is that uh, in order to validate slavery, in order to validate something that the founders knew was wrong, all along, people have had to come up with reasons for slavery and then for reasons for Jim Crow and mistreating African-American and African-Americans and people of color. And, you know, some of those reasons saying that, you know, we're less intelligent or we're less capable or, you know, whatever those things are, you know, that fits with, you know, the uh, founders uh, accepting the idea that African Americans were three fifths of a person. You know, those kinds of things have filtered down to what we experience now uh, and have experienced, you know, in, the, in, in modern times in relationship to laws, in relationship to uh, housing policies. I mean, from 1910 to 1970, uh, when white people were experiencing the uh, rise in home ownership and, and, and suburbs were created, African Americans were, you know, through policy on the other side of the tracks, by and large. You know, and I'm just saying that those are, uh, are, are um, uh, and, and uh, you know, th those are just uh, a natural flow. You know, if you have a certain attitude and thought about a person and you carry that on and carry that on, the natural outcome is that that person is going to be treated differently. And my, my thinking about prison, uh, well-documented uh, in, in, in the, the New Jim Crow, uh, that book, um, I think um, it's, it's just a carryover, it's just a continuation. You know, President Clinton uh, followed uh, the uh, uh, laws uh, established by Reagan and Bush one, uh, and, and didn't even realize what kind of damage he was doing to African American community. And so I think uh, prison uh, sentences being higher for African Americans, the number of African Americans, you know, uh, per capita incarcerated, all of that just stems from, you know, what America has done uh, from its beginning. And it's just something that we have to recognize. You know, it's not about pointing the finger. It's not about blaming and shaming. It's just about recognizing what the situation is, has been, mm -hmm. and, and, and changing it, reversing it. That, that's my thinking. Understood. Thank you for that. And Reverend Williams, I know you mentioned earlier about the ID laws. So can you kind of talk about how um, that impacts um, the, the broader, I guess, Omaha community in the state of, of Nebraska? How do, how do you think that would play out? Why is it important that we uh, take part in, in, in taking a side on that? Well, first of all, uh, the Douglas County Elections Commissioner specifically and other elections commissioners across our state have said that it's not needed, first of all. Uh, to make our elections safe, we do not need voter ID. The way that they verify voters today in Douglas County and in the state of Nebraska uh, shows, uh, uh, and, and the way it works uh, has us in the place we are 
which is we have no voter fraud, no uh, uh, fraud in, in our elections. That uh, certainly that would impact the outcome or anything else. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is because of the ID uh, requirement, uh, senior citizens who may not have transportation, individuals who may uh, um, need money actually to get the ID. Let me, let me say it this way. We have a, a member in our executive committee who moved here from New Hampshire and he needed to get just a regular ID. To get that driver's license, he had to go out to 170th Street or something and um, it took time and he had to, because he, he didn't bring with him a copy of his uh, birth certificate, there was some other things he had to hurdles he had to jump and able to get his ID. So you think about the number of individuals who uh, may not you know, have a birth certificate you know, it's undue stress on them. Plus getting the birth certificate and then getting the voter ID. The gentleman uh, on our executive committee spent up to uh, uh, almost a, a near $100 uh, to be able to actually finally get his ID. Now, uh, uh, the other thing that uh, we had was a, a part of our presentation that night was a video from a, a, a gentleman in, in Lincoln who has recently uh, suffered eye issues and um, the wherewithal, again, to go and get the ID for a person who may be blind, a person who may need transportation, uh, a person who uh, may be young and uh, is, is eligible to vote, but uh, doesn't again have the money or the funds. It's just an unnecessary hurdle. And really the idea behind voter ID is to restrict young people and people of color from voting. I mean, it's really comes out of, if you look at it, out of the election of President Obama in 2008, the push from the Tea Party and others after that for voter ID, that's when it really increased. All right, thank you so much for that, Reverend Williams. So we do have another question. Uh, are there additional needs that you and the local NAACP leaders see as important focus areas for the organization's work here in Omaha? Yes, uh, I'm going to put up this screen. These are our officers, uh, Preston Love Jr., First Vice President, Mr. Chris Crithers, who is the uh, vice president. Uh, chair of the Douglas County Elections Commissioners, our second vice president, Deb Shaw, Crystal uh, Fox, our secretary and assistant. Uh, this young, young man, Ellery Hogan is our treasurer. Tamara um, Bailey is our assistant treasurer. Uh, and if I can, these folks. So uh, to answer the question, Mr. Uh, Steve Jackson, this gentleman is uh, a previous uh, past president. He is the chair of our health committee. Uh, they uh, work on health disparities. Uh, you know, again, we're civil rights organizations. So we don't just, you know, talk about uh, what's happening. We look at it from a civil rights perspective and try to bring uh, policy change to bear to impact uh, that disparity. So uh, Mr. Jackson chairs our health uh, committee and we, we know health disparities in Douglas County, certainly COVID uh, uh, exacerbated those. Uh, this gentleman is Mr. Boris Forte. He is the uh, chair of our political action committee, uh, voter registration, uh, getting folks out to vote, uh, political uh, um, uh, candidate forums, uh, informing people, as well as uh, we, we testified uh, in, in Lincoln on a number of uh, the bills that were presented at the legislature, as well as issues before the city council. So uh, 
This gentleman is Mr. Eddie Nelson. He's the chair of our Veterans Affairs Committee. He says this past legislative session was really a negative one for veterans. And you think about everybody supports our veterans, you would think, right? So um, uh, Veterans Affairs, you could be involved uh, with Mr. Nelson and the work that he's doing. Uh, this is Mr. Barry Thomas, uh, a longtime educator and chair of our education committee. He is uh, currently uh, a, a consultant, uh, but our education committee, a lot of people don't know, the state of Nebraska actually has for K through 12 education, a multicultural education law. There's a requirement, there are standards for multicultural education in Nebraska. Uh, his uh, focus, the focus of that committee is to uh, ensure that uh, multicultural education happens in Nebraska. It's important for all of us to know about each other. And I'm not just talking about black and white here. You know, we have Native Americans, certainly Asians, folks from uh, uh, the Korean uh, uh, community as, and, 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 and many, many others. Um, uh, one of our presenters that night uh, in that conversation was uh, uh, Mr. Tim Royers, who um, is a member of uh, the Millard School District, as well as a high school teacher, uh, has been a high school teacher. And he said when he taught, it was really important for him in his social study classes to be able to uh, bring out uh, the contributions of different uh, communities, and it enhanced the learning of, of all the students. Another thing that I would share about education is that um, the way we got the multicultural education law in Nebraska is that there were students, high school students in uh, uh, Norfolk who were, uh, who were having a change in their community because of packing plants and the number of people of color who had come to work in the packing plants. And so they had a conversation about, you know, the, the change in their community. And so they, uh, as, as outflow of that conversation in their class, they invited four individuals to do a panel discussion on race in Norfolk. This was in the 1990s. Ernie Chambers, State Senator Ernie Chambers was one of those individuals. He came, challenged them, and to make a long story short, their teacher, Jim Kubik, actually wrote the multicultural education law and Ernie Chambers helped get it passed. Awesome, awesome. Um, uh, these others, uh, 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 Miss Nelson, Alberta Nelson is chair of our bylaws. She kind of helps us with governing ourselves appropriate. Uh, Marita Franklin is member of our executive committee. And this is Mr. Uh, Sean McGee. This is the gentleman uh, from New Hampshire that moved to Nebraska to help take care of his mother. Uh, he is an educator uh, 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 at the, from the University of New Hampshire and is a, uh, you know, uh, worker in, in civil rights was member of NAACP there in New Hampshire. And he's a member of our executive committee. These are uh, functioning committees that uh, in the Omaha branch of the NAACP now, uh, our goal is to really grow them. Each one of them have between seven and 12, 14 members probably in the education committee right now, uh, in our largest committee. But we, we uh, desire, and, and if folks are interested in any of these areas, uh, we desire to grow these committees so that we might do more of the work uh, in these areas, education. You, you, you know the, the challenges facing our public schools today. Uh, one of the things I'm most concerned about uh, is uh, the number of, of teachers that are retiring and leaving the profession. What a stress and strain that's putting on our uh, public school system. Uh, so um, health, I, I mentioned that. So uh, these are our functioning committees uh, and these, these are the chairpersons of those committees. Thank you so much for that, Reverend Williams. I wanna thank you for engaging with our audience this evening. Do you have a final message that you would like to share with our audience members? Now, I think it's just important for people to talk to one another. 
to get to know one another. I appreciate Metro, Metro uh, uh, Community College for this conversation tonight, for allowing me to have this opportunity to share. Um, when I came to Omaha in 1986 to go to Grace University, one of the things I learned about Omaha is that the way the community was settled is that, you know, uh, Italians lived here, Germans lived here, Croatians lived here, you know, uh, uh, where, where uh, uh, I first, you know, kind of settled in Omaha was actually called Little Italy. Uh, and, and I had members, I, I started off pastoring a church in South Omaha, and the people in our uh, congregation were from what was called Goose Hollow. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, they were ethnic folks uh, who settled in this uh, city. And one of the things that I've learned is that people uh, are now, you know, just kind of getting out of that and getting to know people across the city in a really big way. Uh, that, that to me is critical. It's important. We have to understand we're all, you know, if I can say this, God's people, amen. Uh, uh, we all um, have the same goals, the same desires. We all want to live a, a quality life. We all want our children to be healthy and to be well. Uh, we all uh, want to be able to uh, feel good about our existence here on earth. And um, I just think we have to understand uh, that it's not about um, labeling and, and putting in a box and all that stuff. You know, it's, it, and I, I'm sorry, I'm just dealing with our political climate and all, some of the stuff that, you know, is, is very, on a, on a large scale, very real today. It, it, it's real that, uh, you know, we, we could have uh, someone uh, back in the White House that would rather divide than to unite. And, and I'm just saying, I think in Omaha, we're making great strides. There are wonderful folks here. We just need to get to know each other. And uh, I would very much encourage you to uh, consider giving some of your time to the NAACP. Uh, we're a, a good organization. We are a, um, a community organization. We uh, don't, if ever, you know, we're not a take to the streets and, and protest kind of organization. We're a learn the facts, uh, organize around those facts, address policy, litigate if necessary uh, kind of organization. And you know, we're not Black Lives Matter. I don't have anything against them, but that's not who we are. So if you're interested in that, we would love to uh, have you uh, join us. Reverend Williams, Thank I want to thank you so much for uh, those parting words. I also want to let those in participation know that we definitely appreciate your feedback. And if you have not done so already, please use the link in the chat uh, to provide us with your uh, feedback via the, the evaluation form. As we continue to prepare for and celebrate Juneteenth, I invite you to join us on Thursday, June 16th at 1230 p.m. Uh, to hear Dr. Maria Esther Hamek. Uh, PhD. She will share information about Juneteenth and the involvement of Mexico in her presentation, the diaspora and the meaning of freedom across the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. Again, I want to thank everyone for attending and please have a great evening.